Hi everyone, I'm Don Dixon and I want to thank you for joining me for another edition of our master class on presentation of lures. Our particular area of study over the last couple of uh, times that we've talked has been casting. We spent, I think we spent two or three weeks talking about trolling and all the, the wonderful and great advantages uh, there are uh, to trolling. Uh, but now we're into this phase on casting. And we started the last discussion uh, talking about casting deep structure. And one of the keys that we touched on was the importance of your boat position when anchoring to cast to a school of fish in deep water. It's critically important. And I'm going to follow up with that today by telling you a story and the important thing about this particular fishing situation, it brought about three things uh, that are all important in this discussion of casting deep structure. Boat position, number one. Speed control, number two. And number three, a structure type that is one that Buck referred to as the perfect structure. So I have this little story I'm going to share with you. It happened in Pennsylvania on Lake Erie. As many of you know, it's one of my favorite fishing holes. Uh, once we discovered what a factory it was when it came to smallmouth bass, I, I know that Lake Erie is really known today for the terrific explosion of, in the walleye fishing there. But uh, really, from a standpoint of smallmouth bass, I can't think of any uh, better uh, water anywhere in the country. Now, I fished all over. I have never seen a better smallmouth factory than Lake Erie. Now, one of the problems with Lake Erie is it pretty much is gin clear. It's clear water. <laughs> no two ways about that. So a shallow movement of fish to me in Lake Erie might be to 25 feet. <laughs> However, I never assume anything in this particular trip. We had caught for two or three days in a row. I was there for a week. For two or three days in a row, we were catching fish like we were on that film out there in 45, 47, 50, 55 feet of water. But each day, I checked a shallower break line that I had discovered on this reef. I have a reef that I'm fishing. I'm going to show you a diagram of it. I've got a reef that I'm fishing, and at a depth of about 24 feet, 24 to 25 feet, it broke a little bit into 30, 32 feet, pretty nice break, and then really slope, kept sloping and sloping and sloping until you got out to about 45, 47 feet when it broke again. But I always would check the 24 foot stuff before I go deep, because it was a good break line. And along this reef where you have the rocky outcroppings and all of that, uh, which I discussed last week, uh, I was trolling this 20, four 25 foot brake line and I'm going to show you a diagram of that brake line and the lake is so straight along the shoreline there are no coves there's no side feeder street cuts coming in uh, in this 10 15 20 mile stretch of, of Lake Erie but there is this beautiful reef that I like to fish and but I'm fishing this brake line it's just running straight and parallel kind of with the shoreline but I'm quite a ways out. I'm probably at least three quarters of a mile out in the lake fishing this 24, 25 feet and breaking. Now for three days, we had been catching so many fish out there in deep water and the weather was, weather was okay. It wasn't great, but it wasn't bad either. We were catching a lot of fish, but they were deep. And I hadn't caught anything shallow. But on this day four, it had really gotten cloudy. There wasn't any sunshine. It was a dark, cloudy morning. And I thought, you know what? I need to check that 24, 25 foot break line before I head out to where I know I can catch those deeper fish. And I had a partner in the boat. Jimmy C was with me. Jimmy from Pittsburgh. Old friend and fishing partner. Any rate, he's in the front of the boat and we're running this break line, 24 feet. So Jimmy and I keep making this trolling pass. We're running 200s uh, on wire line. And we're fishing this 24 foot embarking. 24, 25. Some places 25 feet. 
and we had gone at least a mile. We had not caught the first fish, and I was just about ready to say, "Real in, we're going out where we know we have the fish." So all of a sudden, I see it breaks off, and I turn back to hit the brake line. And when I turn back, it just stays at 32 feet, 32 feet, 32 feet. I keep turning, I keep turning, I keep turning. And finally, it came back to 24 feet and stopped. But I'm now heading straight towards the shoreline. Now, as soon as I saw that there was a major turn, change in direction on that brake line, I immediately threw a marker way back, as far as I could throw it, back to where I just came from. And you see that marker on my diagram. Now... I had to establish, did I create a structure situation here or is it just a little finger and then it just continues to move up the uh, lake parallel to the bank like I've been doing for the first mile. So I told my partner to reel in. So we reeled our lures in, so I'm sure it was cutting across there or somewhere, but we just reeled our lures in and I was going to do a quick mapping job. So I reversed my way back out and I came around that marker to see how my marker was in relationship to the end of that little turn. And it was literally, it was in pretty good position. So I just left it there. And when I turned back, keep in mind now, we talked about this in our discussion on following brake lines. I think we talked about it uh, with a question from one of the subscribers uh, on our Q&A about how we're not following a, a number. We're not following 25 feet. We're following a brake line. So as I turn back, coming up out of 32 feet, it stopped at 24. So my, I still have my brake line, but I'm heading towards shore. So I turn back off. As soon as I saw it breaking into that 30 feet, I immediately swung the boat back again. But by this time, I'd gone another 10 yards or so. When it came up, it didn't stop at 20. I mean, it didn't stop at 24. It kept going and it finally stopped at 22 feet. And then when I saw it stop, that's my brake line. So then I angled the boat back out. And as soon as I saw it start to break off again into the 30-ish 30, 30 feet, I turned the boat back in. But this time I'm another 15 yards closer to the shoreline. And this time when the needle came back, it didn't stop at 22. It went all the way to 20 and stopped. Now my brake line is breaking at 20 feet into 27. Before, out here at the end, it was 24, 25 into 32. I'm still on the same brake line, but the numbers are changing, my friend. It's going, as I talked the last time we met, that thing from the shoreline coming out into the lake, like every other land formation, it's like this. So this brake line, is going uphill. It's getting shallower. Same brake line, but it's getting shallower. So I kept on going, and I'm still heading directly in towards the bank. Very unusual for Lake Erie, for any of the Great Lakes. Normally, they're just big bowls that go like this. But now I've got something that looks like a two-sided bar like in a big flatland reservoir we talked about in Texas, two, flatland where you have a side feeder stream cut coming out, meeting the main river channel, forming a two-sided bar. That's what this is beginning to look like. And as I continued along that brake line, at the very end, it broke off into about 27 feet. And as I turned back the last time, it didn't stop at 20. It went all the way to 17. And then I turned back off. And at 17, when I turned back off, it stayed 17, stayed 17, stayed 17. And then that thing turned and headed straight up the lake. Now, a couple of things you have to know about that structure situation. Buck refers to that as the perfect structure. Most of the time you find it where you have two streams coming together, where they split, could be in a river, could be in a reservoir where two main channels met. And on one side, you have that brake line. There's a bar, but you have a brake line that's going uphill. In this case, we're in Lake Erie. I never expected ever in my wildest dreams to find something like this in Lake Erie. But bigger in life, there it was. Fortunately, my knowledge, my study of all the material, and the many times I had fished a situation like that, I recognized it right away. I was just surprised it, there was one like this that existed in Lake Erie. So two things to remember. 
when the fish make contact with this structure situation, they're going to hit it at the end of the bar. We're calling this now a bar. It's a two-sided bar. They hit it at the end of the bar, but they're not going to come up over the crown of this. It's just a big flat up in there. We're still out here where that brake line was. We're, we're a mile from the shore. It's all just a 20-foot flat up in here. There's no crown of a bar or anything like that. It's just like a, a side feed of stream cut came out and met the main channel. But it's not what it is. But it's what it looks like. From the standpoint of a structure situation, it's exactly the same as a side feeder stream cut coming out and meeting the main channel. The further you follow that side feeder stream cut, the shallower the brake line gets until you're up there on the shoreline. Same thing is happening here. But when I got to a depth of where that brake line had changed from 25 feet in breaking, 22 in breaking, 20 in breaking, 17 in breaking, then the 17 just turned like that and head it straight up the lake parallel with the shoreline here's what you got to remember not only is that a perfect structure they hit to the end of the bar they just follow that brake line and as weather and water permits if they can get shallower they just come right up that brake line so as we look at this diagram i want you to mark this down up here mark it down in your structure fishing memory in your bank. Uh, when you have a brake line that's going uphill like that, that is what Buck refers to as the perfect structure situation. If it's just follow that one brake line right on up and it continue to go until the, until the weather and water says, hey, don't go any further than that. That's shallow enough for today. And then they turn around and leads them right back to the home area. It's the perfect situation. We don't have to do a lot of fan casting fish all over the flats, any of that. We know when those fish move, they're coming right up that brake line. Now, there's another thing I want you to put in your memory bank, structure fishing memory bank. When you have that situation or one like it on any kind of a structure, when you're following that brake line, it goes up and it hooks and goes, changes direction totally. That's what I call an inside hook. The opposite of a finger going down another finger. But once it hooks and turns direction and goes that way, a fish will never go beyond that spot. Once you arrive at that hook, that's it. They're not going any further. I had the knowledge of that structure situation because I'd run into it in flattening reservoirs and flattening ones, flattening twos, I ran into it in lowland fours, I run into it in, in lowland twos, delta situations. So I fished that situation many times. However, I didn't expect to find it in Lake Erie, but we did. We found it in Lake Erie. So I told my partner Jimmy, I said, here's what I want you to do. Uh, put on a 200 with wire. And with wire, we have some flexibility. We have a lure that runs from 9 to 12 feet, but on wire, we can run it down 24. We can actually run it to 27, 28 uh, if we wanted to. But we also have the ability to pick some wire up and have that lure change in depths with us, just like this brake line is going to be changing depths. So I said, I want you to put on a 200 with wire like we were running before. But I'm going to go back out there, and I said, we're going to make some pattern passes. First, I'm going to come across that end of that bar right there where the marker is and once we come off and free run if we don't catch a fish I'm going to loop out there and I'm going to make a pass straight up this brake line now when I was doing that little map and seeing that brake line changing every time I came up come out of the deep and it come up to 22 feet I threw a marker and then I turned off and went a little ways further and, and when I turned back up came to 20 feet Ooh, threw a marker. And when I turned back off and then came back up to 17 feet, I threw a marker and then I saw that 17 feet hook out. So I knew at that end marker, that was it. If we could be lucky and get to fish up 17 feet, they're coming right to that end marker. They're coming right up this brake line where I now have three markers. And we don't have to fish any other part of this deal. They're either at the end of the bar or they're coming somewhere up this brake line. So I said, now, here's what we're going to do, Jimmy. Put on 200. We have some versatility. 200 with wire. 
going to come across there. We don't catch a fish off the end of that bar. I'm going to loop the boat out, get the lures in behind us, and I'm going to make a straight line pass, heading up that brake line, and making sure our lure hits the end of that bar. And we're going to be adjusting our lures. Here's how we're going to do it. Once we feel that lure starting to get a little heavy on the bump, we're going to pick up some line real quick. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. And then we run a little bit further, and then I turn off and we turn back, and all of a sudden now it's breaking at 20 feet. Pick up, pick up, pick up. So we picked up, we kept adjusting our lures was going to be the idea. That's how I instructed them. This is what we're going to do. We turn around. We don't catch one going off. We turn around, loop the boat, head straight towards the bank along those three markers that I'd already thrown. And about the time we got a little bit further past the second marker, our lure was getting, because we're running a pretty long line to get to the end of the bar. So by the time we got up a little past that second marker, our lure's at the end of the bar, bang. As soon as the lure bumped two, three times, I hit a fish. And it wasn't just a fish. It cleared the water. And it looked to be six pounds smallmouth. Now, I wasn't sure how big it was, but I knew it was a big fish. Again, as we're discussing casting deep structure, you hit an adult fish uh, downstairs uh, like we just did. He's not alone. Guaranteed, he's not alone. That fish is not alone. And we had a great weather condition. So I reeled that fish in as quickly as I could. But if you want to catch school of fish, you got to get that fish out of the school and in the boat quickly as possible without being reckless. I'm not talking about like sometimes I see some tournament guys, you know, using something that looks like, you know, it was made out of a, you know, a broom handle, you know, <coughs> flipping and pitching and hit a fish and one stroke, they got him in the boat you know, fishing for money. I'm not talking about doing that and being reckless, but I'm talking about you got an adult fish on there. And normally, uh, I'll bring them in pretty quick. I'm not going to play around with them. I'm not going to see how many times I can let them jump. I'm getting them in the boat because I want to catch more. That's the idea. So, I reeled that fish in and I told Jimmy, I believe there's fish out there on the end of that bar. I said, we got to anchor down and cast. Now, as you can see, up to the left of my brake line, it's just all 17, 20 foot flats. I have no anchor in position. And where I know the fish would stop at that hook, they could never go further than that. I already know that. That would be the perfect anchor in position. Only problem was it was 17 or 18, I think, I believe it was 18 feet deep. Now all I have to do is be able to duplicate that depth and speed control on the cast, but I can't. The shallowest I can anchor is 17 or 18 feet. I, ha I, I can't throw my spoon plug. I'm sad about that, but at the same time, I don't want to go out and make continued trolling passes because certainly that after a few fish, that's going to spook the school at that depth in clear water. So I said, Jimmy, here's what we're going to do. I want you to tie on a heavy jig, the heaviest thing you got. I don't care, three-quarter ounce. Try, tie on something heavy. So he starts searching through his, through his box. I tied on, a, I think it was either five eighths or three quarters. And from where we were parked at the hook to the end of the bar, I'm going to take a wild guess at 50 yards. With a long cast with my seven foot stick, I could reach the end of the bar with that heavy jig. I sunk the jig to the bottom. Jimmy's still fumbling around trying to find a heavy jig. Now, in this situation, i got to use a jump bait. I don't want to. It's a slow bait by nature, but it's my only choice. Remember, we only have two choices. In this case, I'm figuring my school of fish is there, but I don't have a casting position to throw a crankbait, so I'm throwing the heaviest jig I have. Now, most of the time with a jump bait, we're thinking we jump it, pick up slack. Jump it, pick up slack. Jump it, pick up slack. Sometimes we're even a little bit slower than that. I've told stories about how slow we had to get at times. Now, when I'm in that situation where I have no choice, there's only two types of lures we can use now. Now I'm forced to use a jump bait. So I picked the heaviest one for two reasons. I can make a really long cast and reach the fish from that little hook position. I can still reach them. And it sinks pretty fast. 
And what I'm going to do now to try to create some form of speed control is to lower my rod tip, pick up the slack once it's on the bottom, and really jerk that rod so the rod tip's, you know, above my cap level. I'm going to really eh, jump it. Now, imagine what's happening downstairs. You're jumping a lure like four, five, six feet off the bottom. Now, we're creating a fast speed control there, but we're also losing our number one control of depth. So, once you jump it, you have to continue to pick up slack and allow it to sink to the bottom. Do not just keep jumping it because it'll leave the bottom and you'll lose number one control. So, I jump that lure hard, picking up slack as it's falling. Pow! I got fish number two, same size as the first one, five and three quarter in that area. It's, they're big bass. Hurry up, got that fish in. I said, Jimmy, haven't you tied any of those fish are out there on the end of that bar? So he had the heaviest jig he could find. And I threw my third cast. I saw his cast coming. He threw in sort of in behind me. But he only got it about two-thirds of the way there. I said, oh, Jimmy, that's not good enough, man. You got to get it all the way out where mine just landed. Put on something heavier. He says, I don't have anything heavier. I said, go in my box. In the meantime, my lure is sinking. I said, go in my box. There's some heavy stuff in there. Grab the heaviest thing you can find. Hurry up and tie on. My lure hit the bottom. I jumped it twice. Pow! Fish number three clears the water. Same size exactly. We got a school of five and three quarter pound smallmouth bass, and I'm not kidding. It's a big group of big fish. At this point, I'm feeling bad, Jimmy. Jimmy's not reaching the fish. So I got in my tackle box real quick, came out with a three quarter ounce, threw it at him. I said, tie that on. So he tied it on, I make cast number four. I make maybe, I don't know, four, five, six jumps. Hard jumps, pick it up slack, let it sink back. And no fish. I said, oh man, don't tell me we lost that school already. And at that point, He's tied on and he makes a cast that reaches about three quarters of the way out to the end of the bar. And I get my lure in about a third of the way in. Bang! I hit fish number four. Jumps out of the water. It's the same size. Before I could land that fish, my partner Jimmy's got one on. And it's jumping out of the water. It's the same size. We got a school of five and three quarter pound smallmouth bass. Now, I don't care where you're fishing. Those are big fish. I know there's a lot of bass fishing out around the Bass Islands. It's shallower out there. It's sort of in this western basin. And there's a lot of bass. But there's a lot of three pound bass. Sure, there's some fours and occasional five. But where are we fishing now? We in a school of almost six pound bass, five and three quarter pound fish. And we're catching them. And now they've moved up that brake line. Now they're about a third of the way in from the end of the bar. So now they're very reachable. We're throwing shorter casts. I'm not throwing all the way out anymore. I throw a three quarter cast, jump it a couple of times, bang, bang. We both hit a double right there about, you know, a third of the way in. Next thing I know, the next cast, we hit the fish a double about halfway up that brake line, about where it's breaking at 20 feet now. So we're throwing shorter casts. We're following those fish. Those fish are coming right to us. They're coming right up that brake line, right towards our boat. And I told my partner, I said, Jimmy, when you hit hook a fish, get them out of that school. Get them in the boat real quick. Get them in the live well before you make that next cast. But you got to be quick. I said, when they see the boat, that's going to be it. So make hay while you can. And most of the time, when you get a good movement, it doesn't last but about 30 minutes. It's a great movement of fish. If it lasts 45 minutes, that's a scoop. You know, normally they don't last that long. So when they're there, you got to make hay. Like you say, you got to make hay with the sun shining. <laughs> so the next cast, we throw it about halfway down that brake line. We hit another double. We put them in it, throw again, halfway down the brake line. We don't jump at two, three jumps, bang, another fish. And pretty soon, we throw, we got two more fish in the boat. We've caught about eight or ten by now, something like that. And we throw out and about halfway out that brake line and no fish. 
and gets about halfway between the halfway point and where we're sitting, bang, bang, a double. That whole school of fish is moving right up at brake line. Like we were sitting there saying, come on, come on, we're, we're right here, come on up here. Now don't go over there, don't go here, come right up here. We, it's like you're following the white line coming right up to us. And we're parked, sitting at that hook. And we catch two or four more fish, I can't remember which it was. And Jimmy landed the fish, and while he was putting it in, I'm making the next cast, he said, Don, he said, look under the boat. And I looked down. And I'm not kidding you folks, there was at least, at least, 150 smallmouth bass surrounding our boat. <laughs> it was like, this is just too good to be true. And what a time to not have a cameraman in a boat filming it. Because it was like three things you can talk about all coming together at one spot. And you, we were able to see the fish so clearly because the water is chin clear. So when they were under the boat, I said, Jimmy, just drop you, just drop your jig straight down. Just pop it a couple of times. Bang, bang. I think we caught three more fish doing that before that was it. And they scooted right back on off that. And I, I made a long cast. And almost at the end of the bar, I caught one more fish. And when all the smoke had cleared, we had caught either 15 or 16. I can't remember exactly, but there was a six fish limit. And since the fish were so really so nice, I wanted to keep a double limit for pictures. Remember, when casting deep structure, we only have two lure choices, crankbait or jump bait. In this case, the jump bait did the trick. We'd have rather been able to use the crankbait, but we couldn't. So we took what we had and we made a terrific catch of fish. Here's the proof. There's the picture. By the way, I wanted to tell you about those pictures. <laughs> We're on Instagram. We're on everything now. Uh, we're trying to get our message across. But I notice on Instagram, people <laughs> take a fish. They hold it so far out, so far in the foreground to the camera. They take a three-pound fish, make it look like it weighs 12 pounds. <laughs> Buck never liked that idea. He said, we don't have to try to blow our fish up. Hold them up under your chin. If you can lift them, hold them up under your chin. Just take a regular picture. People will see how big those fish are. So there's my stringer up. Big, small mouth. But this was the best catch of weight. A limit of six, basically a limit of six pounders. What you have. That's pretty awesome. That's really pretty awesome. And it was done with a jump bait. So as we conclude this, cast in deep structure. You have boat position. You must anchor shallower than 10 feet in order to throw the crankbait, which is preferred, always preferred. And when you can't, you can still make a great catch with a jump bait. So until the next time, I hope you got something out of this little story. Until next time we have a chance to chat. Uh, be sure to follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and be sure to subscribe. I had another question from a guy today. He said he, he can't get a comment to go on uh, on the video so where he can ask a question. So he was going to write me a question, write me a letter or an email or something. I said, listen, that's because you haven't subscribed yet. <laughs> in order to have your question show up in the comment section, you have to be a subscriber. So it, you haven't subscribed yet. So I'm saying it's about time. <laughs> Go ahead, subscribe. Will you see that little red button down here? Push that. Do what it tells you to do. There's no charge. It doesn't cost you anything. So go subscribe. It helps us out. And at the same time, you'll then be able to post your questions uh, on the video comment section. And I appreciate having you here. And I appreciate everybody else that was here today. And I'll see you the next time.